Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you're accomplishing. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to continue on that this evening. We're talking about the fruit of faith. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. We talk about faith. We pointed out that this is the word pistis in the Greek, which means faith. Many translations have translated faithfulness, which is error, as we have pointed out. This is the word pistis, as you see below. That is the word which means faith. And as we have pointed out before, but pointed out again tonight, Galatians 3.9 has both of these words for faith and faithful in this verse. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. I put the cursor over the word faith. It is the word pistis, as we saw. I put the cursor over the word faithful. It is the word pastos, which is the word for faithful. It is great error. Most of the translations, majority of them, all have translated it faithfulness in error, which is wrong. We've talked about many things about faith, principles of faith, how we put our faith in operation, how we develop it, how we get the word in us, a general faith, a specific faith that comes into us through hearing the word, and then we put our general spirit of faith in operation, mixing it with the word we hear to see fruit of faith come forth in our life. And we talked about things that would hinder us from seeing the fruit of faith produce in the last time we're together. Tonight, we're going to concentrate on the word of God in your mouth in order to bring forth results, the fruit of faith in your life. First of all, we see over in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Here's Jesus it's speaking of who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When it says upholding all things by the word, this is the word rhema, which means the spoken word of his power. What was he speaking? The word of God. What's in the word of God? The power of God. How do we release the power of God? by speaking it forth. When we are speaking the word of God, what are we doing? We're putting those word of faith in operation. We know this from Romans chapter 10, verse 8, which we have seen. What saith it? The word, rhema, the spoken word, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Remember, specifically, the word in our heart produces specific faith. That is the word of faith, the rhema, the spoken word of faith, which we preach. So Jesus was speaking the word of faith. He was speaking the word of God that released the power of God that is resident in the word. Now, God wants us to get full of power through the word in us, get full of specific faith through the word in us, and learn to speak the word to release the power of God and put our faith in operation to see God accomplish what he purposes for us in our life. We see, as it says in verse 9, what, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here's the word in our heart, and here's the word in our mouth. The specific faith, and then we release out, we work our faith, we are releasing our faith by speaking forth words. And that is so important. Now, we also see over in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where this was spoken from, but a little bit different. Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. <laughs> he says, The word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Otherwise, as the words in your heart and words in your mouth, it's not only releasing your faith with the power of God coming out, but it's also keeping the word before you so you will do it. Otherwise, God wants us to be a doer of God's word. That's another way, of course, that we put our faith in operation. Now, another thing that we see regarding the words of our mouth that release our faith and release the power of God Another important point that we must understand. 
Psalms 50, verse 16. Notice what he says. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Could the wicked take his covenant in their mouth? No. But it's interesting, he says about taking my covenant in thy mouth. Who is supposed to take the covenant in their mouth? Those who are believers. Those who are in covenant relationship with him. In the New Testament, we are in covenant with him, and you and I are to take his covenant in our mouth because we're going to speak forth the word of God. And what does that do? That releases him to bring things into being. Now, when we're speaking God's word, John chapter 6, verse 63. John 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, what are they? They are spirit and they are life. So there's power in them. They release power. They're going to produce life. And they're also going to be that which is of the spirit. You're always, when you're speaking God's word, you are functioning in the spirit and you're putting that which is spirit in operation. Remember, this faith that we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we look over here in verse 13. It says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Notice it is a spirit of faith. Well, whenever you do what God's Word says, you're going to be operating in the Spirit. And when you're speaking God's Word, you're going to be speaking with your spirit of faith as you believe the Word in your heart, and then you speak it forth to put it in operation in your life. Now, when we do this, though, we've got to be accurate. We can't just speak whatever we want. We must speak precisely in line with the Word of God. Look what it says in Philemon, verse 6 that the communication, this refers to the participation in this context, the communication or releasing or, or participation of your faith may become effectual. This is the word energase, which means active and operative. So the participation or the communion or the putting into operation of your faith is going to become effectual as far as actively operative when? By, which really is the word in, E-N, in, should be a better way I would translate it, as Young's does, the precise, correct knowledge, this is the word epigenosis, precise, correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. It's important to realize this is the word that's translated acknowledging there in the King James. Well, this is a noun. This is not something like a participle or something that has a verbal type of a, a phrase to it. So that's why it should not be an acknowledging. Instead, it's talking about a precise, correct knowledge. It's a noun. So, the participation communication of your faith is going to become actively operative in the precise, correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Well, how are you going to discover that? In the Word. You've got to get the Word of God in you. You've got to get the exact knowledge of God, exactly what it says, precise, correct. And so then what you're going to be speaking is going to be speaking the Word to bring those promises and those things of every good thing that belongs to you in Christ Jesus to bring it into being. Now, what else is going to happen when you put the Word of God in your mouth? Remember, that's how you're going to release your faith. We see another principle shown over here in Exodus 4, verse 15. He says, Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth just as God wants to put words in our mouth. And notice, he says, I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. So God is going to teach us and he's going to put his words in our mouth as we are speaking forth the things that he's taught us. And notice, when his words are in our mouth, what happens? He is with our mouth. Otherwise, you're releasing God. You're putting God in operation as you're speaking forth the word of God. 
and remember who is a performer of the word, who's the one who sees that the word is going to come to pass. It's the Holy Spirit. We see that when you are speaking God's word, exactly and precisely, you're going to put the Holy Spirit in operation as well. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. The Spirit of the Lord, He speaks, speaks by you. How? Because the word of God is in your mouth. So when you are speaking forth a word, the Holy Spirit will be speaking through you because He is going to be performing the word as you are putting your faith in operation. So, you got God's word in your mouth, you put it in operation, you're going to be releasing your faith, the power of God's going to go forth, the Holy Spirit's going to be working, you are going to see that you're taking the covenant promises in your mouth, that you're speaking into being, you're actively putting these things in operation to see your faith become actively operative and produce results. Words are full of power. They fit in line with the word. But if they're not in line with the word, they're nothing. They'll do you absolutely nothing. You have to understand, though, that nonetheless, words are carriers. They carry things. They contain things, whatever kind of words you have, speaking forth and you're out of your mouth. So we've got to be sure we're speaking right words. Words aren't just merely sounds. They are a power sent forth. You can speak evil words, and you actually release evil power out of you. Or you can speak good words or right words in line with the word, and then release good things out of you. Of course, if you speak God's word, then you're going to see things be brought into being that are from God in the Spirit. That's why you want to be sure, if you're going to speak something, you want to be speaking things that are in line with the Word of God. Look how God brought everything into being. Genesis 1-3, God said words, Let there be light, and there was light. He spoke things into being. You and I are going to do the very same thing to release our faith to bring the promises of God into being. We also see this even declared over in Hebrews, in chapter 11, and verse 3, where it says, Through faith we understand that the ages, not world, but the ages, aeon, were framed by the rhema, spoken word of God. Remember, Jesus spoke the word of God to uphold all things, and that's the spoken word of faith, but release the power. So the ages were framed by the spoken word of God. That's how he brought things into being. So the things which are seen, everything in the natural realm, were not made of things which do appear. That means all the things that are seen were made of things which do not appear. What does not appear? That which is of the spirit. So that tells you the things of the spirit brought the things of the natural into being. How? By words spoken that were spiritual words, that then brought the things seen into manifestation. They were made of things which, which were, do not appear, not things that do appear. So it's important for you, of course, from this to see your mouth is a releaser of your faith. You gotta be sure you got the right words coming out of your mouth. They are releasers of something. You make sure that you're speaking the right things and you wanna see your faith be put in operation. Now, another thing we gotta realize well, you say, well, if I speak right words, great. How about if I speak wrong words? No big deal. They won't do anything. Oh, no. Words have effect regardless of whether you realize it or not. We come down to verse 27. This is talking about when Isaac was deceived by Jacob. Here, Jacob comes before him to get this blessing from, from Isaac. He came near and he kissed him and he smelled the smell of his raiment, blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, now he begins to speak things over him. God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. He's speaking blessing over him. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. <coughs> he spoke all these words over his life. These were blessings that were released. Now, we come down to verse 33. What happens then? This is when all of a sudden Esau comes in. And he thought that was Esau before. 
And Esau, trem Isaac trembling very exceedingly, said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. When I, Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. He said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthday, which is a lie. He gave it away to him, remember. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. He said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Look what he says now. Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants with corn and wine, and by sustained him, and what shall I now do unto thee, my son? Otherwise, the blessing was released by what he spoke, and he couldn't stop it. He couldn't reverse it. He couldn't take it back. Because words release things. Words are carriers. You spoke words, they're out and they're doing something. His words were set, therefore he could not change anything. Your words can cause destruction if you speak the wrong thing. Your words can speak blessing if you speak the right thing. But your words, you speak forth, you, you can't call them back. They're, they're doing something. They have an effect. We see this also over in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. We've got to watch the words we speak. Verse 6, he says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. How would that cause your flesh to sin if you speak wrong words that come from the flesh instead of speaking spiritual words that are in line with the word of God? And then you would sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Oh, I'm sorry, angel, I spoke the wrong words. <laughs> no, that's not going to make it. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? That's quite a statement. God could get angry at your words and destroy the work of your hands because you spoke wrong words. He expects us to speak right words. Your words can bring forth blessing, they can bring forth cursing. Remember it says in, in James, there's blessing and cursing coming out of the mouth. These things ought not so to be. We need to be sure we're speaking right words. Wrong words can cause you to sin with your flesh because it's not coming from the Spirit. Remember, you're to function in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Anything that's of the Spirit will be in line with the Word of God and it'll be good. Anything that's of the flesh, it will not be in line with the Word of God, and it will be sin, and it will cause destructive effects in your life. This brings us to Psalms 12, verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Obviously, those aren't things coming from the Spirit. Those are things that are coming from the flesh, and it's sin. And he, he's going to judge these guys that speak with flattering lips or proud things. <laughs> They're going to be cut off, it says. That's quite a statement. Who have said, what did they say? With our tongue will we prevail. Well, we can speak whatever we want into being, thinking they can do that. <laughs> our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Well, they understood about how words could bring things into being. We're going to prevail with our tongue and our lips are our own, well, we can just control whatever we want to do. No. Who is Lord over us, they said. Well, that's a big mistake. We got to understand we are bought with a price. We belong to Him. Our lips are not our own. They belong to Him. And we are to have Him Lord over us. And one of the ways that we show that He is Lord over us is by speaking right words with our mouth. We must learn to speak right words. Job understood this. In Job 6, we pick over here in verse 25, how forcible are right words. They release good things when they're right words. But what that you're arguing reprove? Now, those are wrong words. You don't want to speak arguing words or mean words or words that are contrary to the Word of God. We've got to learn to speak right words. That's how you're going to release your faith. Many people... Believe the word, but they speak wrong words. Or they start out speaking right words, and they don't continue, and they turn around and start speaking wrong words. 
and they wonder why things don't work. You have to operate according to spiritual law. Some people say, oh, it sounds like you're being legalistic. God's Word is law. It is being legalistic according to the Spirit, according to God's ways. And that's what we have to come in line with. We think we're going to do it our way or any way we want and see God bring something forth. It ain't going to happen. No. We've got to speak what He says accurately in line with His ways. 1 Samuel 3.19. Here's one who did speak God's Word correctly and right. Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Well, they must, be, must have been words of the Spirit, they, which came from God. God must have told them what to speak, and he spoke the right words. And none of his words fell to the ground, otherwise they produced. If we will learn to speak right words, our words will produce as well. At the same time, we have to understand the truth declared in Proverbs 18. Verse 21, where it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We can release death, or we can release life. It all depends on what we're speaking. If we think that it doesn't matter what we say, and we, don't, we speak contrary to the word, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. We can release death by the words of our mouth. God wants us, of course, to speak right things. Life, it's in the power of the tongue. The tongue has, has power in it. In fact, if we speak wrong words, the enemy is going to take us captive. Proverbs 6.2, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken, which means captured and seized, with the words of thy mouth. The devil can capture you if you speak wrong words. We also know that we're, we're told in James how we must watch what we speak. If we don't speak right words, are we going to see any good results? No. Look what it says, James 1.26. If any man among you seem to be religious, ah, he seems like he's, he's a Christian following the way of the Lord, and bridleth not his tongue, his tongue just speaks all kinds of stuff, but deceiveth his own heart, which tells you what happens, because when you speak it, not only goes out to others, but it also goes inside, you hear it on the inside of you. This man's religion is vain. The word vain means devoid of force, truth, success, result, useless, of no purpose. You could be born again. You don't bridle your tongue, you see your own heart. You can be basically dysfunctioning with useless, no purpose, no success, no result, devoid of force, just going around, just walking in the flesh. There's a lot of Christians that are doing that, unfortunately. We want to make sure that we are putting the power of God in operation. Remember, Jesus upheld all things by the spoken word of, of his power. That's why your words are so important. Now, your tongue, of course, we already saw you can speak from, out of the flesh with your mouth, which will, God would even cause them to destroy the work of your hands, as we saw. We've got to understand your mouth can sin, and we got to correct anything so we don't. Psalms 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. It means we got to really be on guard that we don't sin with our tongue. I will keep guard my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Well, the wicked's before us all the time because the evil spirits are out there listening. So God wants you to make sure you're guarding your mouth like a bridle and speaking right words. And you do not sin with your tongue. You take heed to your ways. Of course, the psalmist in Psalms 19, verse 14, makes this statement. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We want our words to be acceptable. They won't be acceptable if they're contrary to the Word of God. As we saw, you destroy the work of their hands. So what is the devil going to try to do in your life? Well, remember, the Word gets in your heart, and then the Word is to come out of your mouth. Well, he's going to try to get the Word out of your heart, of course, first of all. Then he knows he's got you for sure. You're going you're to go nowhere. Mark chapter 4 Verse 15, these are by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. 
He wants to get the word out of your heart, so then you won't have any faith, specific faith. Then, of course, he would like you to speak wrong words. He'll do anything possible to get you to not speak right words. And so, in fact, he'll speak things even against you. We've got to watch that we only speak the right things. Remember what it says over in, in James chapter 3 that we were referring to earlier? Comes down to verse 9. He says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse we men, which are made out of the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. Now the devil gets to people to speak cursing. Brethren, these things ought not so to be. It should not be happening whatsoever. This is why you got to guard your heart and you got to make sure you're also that your mouth is being bridled and you're only going to speak right words. Well, how am I going to do this? It's keeping the word before you is going to be the key. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and following. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Hear them. Let them not depart from thine eyes. You want to be seeing them. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, which is what happens when you hear them or see them, they come into you, and now you've got to guard yourself so the enemy doesn't take the word out of your heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. That's what they'll produce in us. Guard, or watch, this is not sorry, actually, which means to watch over. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues or the outgoings of life. This is, word actually means outgoing in the Hebrew. The outgoings of life. Therefore, we got to guard ourselves. We got to watch over our heart with all diligence, which means you can't let things come into your heart. And they come into you through what you hear, what you see, what you're speaking, what you're thinking, all these things that are affecting you coming into your heart. We got to guard ourselves and make sure that we're speaking right things. At the same time, the devil's going to try to get you to speak negative things. He knows. If he can't get the word out of your heart, then what's he going to do? Make sure you don't speak the right words. Psalms 56 tells us how about the enemies will do. Verse 5. Every day, talking about the enemies, they rest my words. They're trying to get your words, get you to speak wrong things. All their thoughts are against me for evil. Evil thoughts. Evil thoughts and try to get negative words coming at you. That's what the enemy seeks to do. Here's an example of where someone didn't deal with the situation properly. It was Moses. Moses is one, of course, used mightily by the Lord, followed the Lord. God did tremendous things, of course, through him. But there came a time when he got in the flesh, and obviously some negative thoughts came into him, and instead of doing what was right, he spoke wrong words. Psalms 106, verse 32, They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sake, because they provoked his spirit, so that he spake unadvisably with his lips. They provoked him. And the devil will try to provoke you, to get you to speak unadvisably with your lips and speak wrong words. What happens when you speak wrong words? Now you're going to see destructive things. And what happened? He didn't get to get, get in the land because of the fact that he spoke wrong words. And so your words are very important. We need to make sure that we, we aren't going to sin with our tongue whatsoever. We see another scripture over in Psalm, Psalm 17. In Psalm 17, verse 3, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. Why would that be? Because he's going to keep his heart right, of course, and he's also going to keep his mouth speaking right. He says, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. We're not going to speak wrong things. I'm going to speak right things. God wants your mouth to be speaking right things. Purpose, that you're only going to speak the things that God wants you to do, God wants you to speak. We see over in Psalms 141, Verse 3, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. You watch over it. Of course, you're responsible to do it now in the New Testament. 
because you now are born again, you know the word, you can choose to yield your tongue to the right thing so you speak right. So you and I are to guard the door of our lips and, and set a watch over our mouth so we don't let our mouth just go off and just speak whatever we want. We cannot be speaking anything out of the flesh. And of course the enemies, they'll try to not only bring thoughts to you, but they'll also try to even speak negative things against you. Anything to try to get to you in some way. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 46. Look what it says. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Now the devil will speak things against you. He'll use people to speak against you, to try to get to you, to try to push your buttons, to try to speak negatives over you. And you cannot let words that others speak affect you in an adverse way. Here's an example where it did affect them, unfortunately, because they weren't established, of course, in the things of God. 1 Samuel chapter 17, they didn't understand the covenant relationship like David did. Here's when Goliath the Philistine comes and he says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Yeah, they got smitten, the enemy spoke those words, and fear and dismay got a hold of them. Well, that, that wasn't any good. Of course, David's the one who understood he had a covenant with God. God had already de defeated the lion and the bear. And he says, who's going to, this uncircumcised Philistine, I, he, he could be taken out as well. What's the key? He had a covenant with God, and he knew and knew that he had a covenant and what God would perform because he would speak. He'd take the covenant in his mouth and speak it forth as we saw. That's what we need to do. But you can't let the words affect you. That words cause fear to come in. Well, certainly we're not going to be operating in faith if we let words bring fear to us. That's why you've got to guard yourself. As we said, whatever's going on in the world, don't let the words that you hear, the things you see, bring fear into you. It will take you out of faith. Judges chapter 16, verse 16, this is talking about how Delilah got to Samson, where he finally told her the truth. Verse 16, it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so his soul was vexed unto death. Where's the battleground? In the soul. The enemy will try to work at you with words or thoughts or some mean to get to you, others speaking words on it, whatever it might be, to get to your soul. And in this case, his soul was vexed unto death. And so now he told her all his heart. And he told the truth about a razor not to come upon his head. He'd been a Nazarite unto God from his mother's womb. And if he was shaven, his strength would go from him. And of course, that's what happened. You must guard yourself and not let the devil press you daily with words or thoughts that would come against you. In fact, Look at what Job said about words that were coming against him. Job 19, verse 2. How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Remember, words are containers. Words are carriers. And they have power. And they have force. They can have negative force or they can have positive force. They can be releasing the enemies power against you, or they can be releasing the things of God on your behalf. It's affecting you. And notice, where's the battleground? In the soul. What do I do about people who speak negative words against me or things that come against me? You can stop all of the effects of them. Remember, they're operating spirit in the spirit against you. What the scripture tells us what to do in Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue, that would be something spoken, that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn it. You condemn those tongues. You cast them down. You speak against them. You don't receive them. You don't let them penetrate and bring you dismay or fear or get you upset or get you down or discouraged or whatever it might be. You condemn those tongues. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness of me. Oh, you and I are in covenant relationship with God. And we have an inheritance that belongs to us as we're servants of the Lord and walking in righteousness, then we'll be, have met conditions 
for acting on this scripture, to declare that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and condemn every tongue that rises against you in judgment. It's interesting what is said here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Your enemies are speaking at you or they're coming at you. And here, and this, this other one, the other wife of there's Hannah, there were two wives of, of the man, and Hannah was being continually harassed and spoken against by the other one because she was one who had, didn't have any children yet. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is all exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. When the enemies come at you, you need to get your mar mouth in operation to be enlarged over your enemies instead of letting them penetrate and affect you. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. Remember, we talked about joy, protecting your faith, and you need to be having your eyes on the Lord. Make sure your mouth's enlarged over your enemies instead of submitting to your enemies and giving place to them and letting them get words into your mouth, resting your words, or getting the words to penetrate you to cause fear, worry, anxiety, or get you in the flesh, get you, you know, reacting with negatives, get angry, get upset, whatever it might be. That means we haven't been guarding ourselves and condemning the tongues. Your mouth needs to get enlarged over your enemies, not giving place to them. How did Jesus conquer the attacks of the enemy? He did it with speaking forth words. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Here's the temptation. Verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He said to him, these are words spoken to him. He answered and said, Jesus spoke words back to him. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He spoke the word of God that was the answer to the temptation that was coming against him. The devil took him up in a holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, here he's speaking words again, if thou be the son of God, like you've got to prove something, you know, cast thyself down, for it's written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and their hands shall he bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. That means the devil knows scripture. He can even quote scripture. But his, of course, was the wrong means, because he was trying to get him to prove that he was the Son of God, which would be tempting God. Jesus, of course, said, It's written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He wasn't going to fall for that. But how did he deal with it? He spoke the word of God. Again, the devil taketh them up to an exceeding high mountain, show them all the kingdoms of the world, the glory of them. And he saith unto him, he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Remember, the devil did have all these things because all the, the authority was given into his hands, and so he had the authority. And then here's this temptation, just fall down and worship me and I'll give you all these things. Well, Jesus didn't dispute the things that he said, don't dispute things that are, that are, if they're true, you know, they're true. You want to speak against the temptation, the thing that's the lie, that's trying to deceive you to do wrong. He, Jesus said to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He dealt with it specifically. You've got to learn to speak against the enemy's temptations. Your mouth is to get enlarged over your enemies. You're going to condemn everything that comes against you, and you're going to speak the word of God that's the answer to the specific temptation so you don't give place to it. That means you can't just sit there and let the devil just pepper you away like Job had vexed his soul, breaking his soul in pieces, you know. Uh, breaking him in pieces, he said. We cannot allow that. You need to speak against that and conquer the enemies. When the enemy comes at you, what are you told to do? James chapter 4, verse 7. Of course, the first thing is you've got to be sure you're submitted to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That means you're submitted to the Word. You're going to think on what the Word says. Not speak out of the flesh. Not speak out of what you feel like. You've got to be submitted unto God to speak what the Word says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You're going to resist him. You're going to set yourself against him with what? The word of God. That's the power of God. You don't deal with things in the flesh. You don't deal with things in the emotions. You deal with things in the spirit according to the word of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And you don't just resist him for a moment. You resist him continually, steadfast, as it says in 1 Peter 
chapter 5, verse 9, where he says, Whom resists steadfast in the faith, strong, firm, immovable, this means. Not just for a moment and then you give in. You do it consistently, strong, immovable, firm, fixed. You're not going to let anything sway you. That is the way you're going to take a stand and you're not going to yield to anything. So this shows us we've got to really get the word in us and the word needs to be in our mouth, whether it's dealing with the enemy or releasing the power of God or taking the covenant in our mouth and bringing promises into being, whatever it might be, we must get the word in our mouth. We see over in Joshua chapter 1. What were part of the instructions that he gave them for going in to possess the land? Joshua 1, that is, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. It's to be in our mouth. We should be speaking it. Because that's the way you're going to release things to come into manifestation. That's the way you're going to deal with the attacks of the enemy by the power of God. That's why Jesus upheld all things by the spoken word of the power of God coming out of him. Thou shalt meditate there in day and night, so you're ready to speak the word. You may observe to do. Of course, if you keep the word in your mouth, remember that, so you will do it, as we saw in Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. According to all that's written therein, for then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success, because you speak things forth. Remember, the angels will hearken to the word, and they'll go forth, prepare the way, and bring you to the place he's prepared for you. Because you learn to speak God's word. Isaiah, chapter 59. In Isaiah 59, verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I put in thy mouth. Notice, the Spirit is upon us. In the New Testament, we receive the Holy Spirit. We got the Holy Spirit in us. But we need to do more than just have the Holy Spirit in us. My words have I put in thy mouth. Because then, the Spirit is going to speak by you, and the words are going to come forth, releasing the power of God. Notice, the words that I put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, for henceforth and forever. Everybody is supposed to be speaking the word. If they'll listen, and if they won't listen, you just make sure you're speaking the word and doing what is right. That's what God expects. Over in Luke, we see something that's, when you understand what's actually said in the Greek, it's, it's very powerful. This is where Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. As he spoke the word into her. And so then we come to verse 37. For with God, this means because, with God it says, nothing shall be impossible. Now when you look at this here, when it's talking about nothing here it's talking about something. This is the word you have to see. When it says, that with God, nothing shall be impossible, we don't see anything about the word, do we? But here's the word, rhema. This is the word rhema right here. What does rhema mean? That which is spoken. Because this is literally, and this is in the nominative, a noun. The noun and the nominative, that means it's a subject. So the subject is about the spoken word. And you, you don't even see it recorded there. Because it's saying, because each spoken word, this goes along with it, nominative, adjective, each spoken word, literally is what this said, shall not be powerless. That's what this word actually means. It shall not be powerless, future tense, it shall not be powerless in here or, or, or uh, before, from, um, or this can mean in, because it is dative, yes, in, when it's, here's the dative case, and in this case it would mean in, not with, because in the, in, in the God, otherwise it's talking about before God, essentially. Or it can mean before God would be probably pretty good as well. So this is literally saying, 
because each spoken word shall not be powerless before or in the presence of God, essentially. That's what this word can also mean here, in the presence of something, in the dative down here. And that's really, or before. That's, that's what that's talking about. You never get that at all by looking at it in the King James or any of these translations. It's talking about the spoken word. The spoken word shall not be powerless in the presence of God. That means you need to understand that. God's spoken word, it's not powerless. It is full of power. And it's in the, in the presence of God, because you're speaking the right words, God is going to take heed to it, and it will come to pass. That's why we need to be speaking right words. Job 22. What does God want you to do? He wants you to speak things into being. Job 22, verse 28. Thou also shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. You decree a thing when you speak spiritual law, you speak decrees, you speak things that are, that are statutes or laws or of, of the Lord, you commandments, you speak these things into being. That's what you do. We decree these things and speak them into being, the promises of God. Also, the word in your mouth is tremendously important to see God's blessings come forth. How many Christians really know the word? Not a lot of them. And it was the word in their mouth much of the time, not too much. No wonder they don't see him doing anything. Psalms 45. My heart is indicted to good matter. I speak of the things which I've made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. That's revealing. It's writing something. Like a ready writer is like a skillful scribe, someone who's skilled, a skilled one who's recounting something. Literally, this means. This can mean someone who's skilled and someone who's recounting or relating something. That's what a scribe would do. So your tongue is like the pen or a marking stick of someone who's, who's a skillful recounting something, speaking something forth. Thou art fair in the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips, which be what? The word. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. That's a tremendous statement. If you and I will pour the right words into our lips, God will bless us because we'll release him to bring forth his blessings in our life. Look over at Proverbs chapter 12. Your words are so important. If you're going to see your faith work to bring forth the fruit of faith, if your words aren't coming in line that are right, you won't see any fruit of faith. It won't happen. Proverbs 12, 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness. Otherwise, how do we know you're righteous? By what you're, not only what you do, of the word of righteousness, but also what you speak. If you're not speaking right things, are you righteous? Are you showing forth righteousness? No. You'd be showing forth unrighteousness instead. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Oh, we don't want to be speaking things that are going to be destructive, piercings of a sword. We want to speak things, of the ones who are wise, that produces health. You can speak your health into being by taking hold of promises and speaking forth these things into being. God wants you to learn to speak right words. Look at verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever. That's only if you're speaking truth. If you're speaking a bunch of negative stuff, it isn't going to be, it's going to get place to the devil, and you're going to have all kinds of destruction. Look at the statement here. We've seen this scripture before, but now in light of this, what we're talking about, quite a statement here in Proverbs 11.11. 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. Otherwise, it's going to be good things are going to happen. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked, who are speaking a bunch of negative things. Negative words can bring things down. Right words can see things be exalted and see God's blessing come forth. The blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. Of course, who's going to be doing it? The ones who are upright. They're walking the straight and narrow, speaking the right words of God. Proverbs 13, verse 2. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, the soul of the transgressors, they're going to eat violence because they're going to speak a bunch of wrong things. He that keepeth, watches over, not sar, his mouth, keepeth, 
That's the word shamar, guards his life. Remember, when the word's in you, it produces what? It produces health and life in your heart. And you're going to speak it out of your mouth. So the one who keeps or watch over his mouth, he's guarding his life. But he that openeth wide his lips, and he just speaks whatever he wants, he's going to have destruction, ruin. All kinds of destruction comes his way. God does not want that for us. We have to, uh, have to understand that we're to speak things into being. That's why we can't be negative. And we can't be one of those venting our problems and talking about our problems and going over all these terrible things that happen to us. How is that helping you? No, that's just reliving it over and over and over. Many people do that. They just want to talk about their problems. They just want to dump it all on someone else because they want someone else to be an ear for them. Don't let somebody just dump things on you. If they're going to want to talk to you, hey, let's, let's talk about the answer. Yeah, here's the situation. What's the answer? Let's start praying the word. Let's start speaking the word to see things be released in order to see God work to turn things around instead of just going on and on and on. And we need to make sure that we're not just venting things. We've got to learn to speak right words. It's so important. Same time, you're going to smite all the enemies as well. You're going to use your mouth to smite every enemy that would come against you. Look what it says in Isaiah 49, verse 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. A sword smites the enemies. You are going to you have your mouth like a sword that's going to smite every enemy and see them be smitten underfoot. Look, we see the testimony of this in 2 Samuel chapter 23. This was Eleazar when the enemies came against him. He was one of the mighty men of David, and it says in 2 Samuel 23, 9, After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. Now he's all by himself. He didn't back off whatsoever. He arose, he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. I mean, he must have been doing a lot of smiting to get to the place where he was tired, his hand was weary. And his hand clave under the sword. Well, what's the sword of the Spirit? The ram of the spoken word, which is the word coming out of your mouth. So if your hand's cleaving to the sword, that means your mouth is continually speaking. Continually speaking God's word. Or speaking what the word tells you to speak, to smite the enemies. And then what happened? The Lord wrought a great victory that day. Hey, if you get attacked, get your mouth in order. Get your mouth start speaking. And keep your mouth speaking. Don't stop. Keep your mouth smiting those enemies until they're all eliminated. That's what you do. His hand clave under the sword. He didn't stop. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. That's what you need to do. Keep speaking. Keep speaking. Keep speaking. And don't get weary. Keep speaking. Well, I don't see anything happening. It's working in the realm of the Spirit. You've got to keep speaking. Come speaking. Keep speaking. Keep speaking. Until you see the victory come forth. God will perform His word in your life. And as you're speaking these words with authority that God has given unto you and commanding as you're to do, one of the things we are to do, and we see even God spoke to us in, in, in the Word and told us we're to do this, Isaiah 45, 11, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask of me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. You command the work of his hands, with your authority as you're commanding these things to happen. Jesus commanded the demons to come out. He commanded the person to be healed, to be made whole, to be his, the ears to be opened. You command the work of his hands as you speak commands to see these things come into being. Even when it's a thing commonly called the Lord's Prayer, they're all commands. You command these things. Every one of them is a command speaking these things into being. You speak commands. And when you do something, and you're speaking right words, what's God going to do? <laughs> He's going to bring it to pass. Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips. He'll bring it into manifestation. If it's the right words, you speak the right things, He'll create the fruit of thy lips if you'll keep speaking the right things into being. That is what he expects, and that's what he wants to see come forth in our life. 
Well, this is why, of course, you've got to learn to speak and continue to speak. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Speaking of Abraham, as it's written, I've made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Remember, we've talked about this before, but we'll review it for a moment. This is not talking about calling something that is not happening as though it was already done, as many have thought. The word be is in the present tense, a present tense participle. The word were, if it's correctly translated, would be a past tense, but it is not. It is the exact same word in the Greek and a present participle. And as we showed you once before, but we'll show you again. This is the first Greek word, a present participle. This is the second Greek word, a present participle. And it's the exact same word if you look at it in the Greek. You may not know Greek, but you can see. That thing that looks like an O is an Omicron. That thing that looks like a crooked V is actually a nu. It's an N. That's a ta, and that's an alpha. And they both have a breathing mark and an accent on the Omicron on both cases. This word and that word are identical. Well, that tells you it has to be the same thing, B to B. So how did they come up with were? Great error. You're going to call, and this is the word in the present tense, you're calling, present tense, continually, those things which are not being as being. In other words, you speak them into being if they're not being. They're not being? I'm going to call them into being. I'm going to speak them into being. And I'm going to declare it, which means you're going to declare what God is doing for you now to speak them into being, to release them to come into being. That's why we keep speaking God's word and speak things into being. And we pointed this out before, but well, again, this is so important to get a hold of. When you're speaking to a mountain or to a hindrance or anything that needs to be removed, regardless of what it is, you speak commanding words and you speak them continually, and every time you speak, it's happening. If you don't understand that and know that, then your faith's going nowhere. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, what do we say? Commanding words. Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. Thou shalt not, you can't doubt in your heart. You've got to believe those things which you say, or shall, it says shall come to pass, which is a mistake. Believe that those things which he says by the way, are we just saying this once? No. The word saith, present tense. Things that we're saying and continuing to say as we keep speaking it and keep speaking it and keep speaking it, not shall come to pass in the future. That's a mistake. Are coming to pass right at the time when you're speaking because this is the present tense. Meaning, believing those, believe those things which you are saying continuously are coming to pass continuously. Otherwise, as you're speaking them, they're happening. You keep speaking it until it comes into manifestation. He shall have whatsoever he saith. God wants you to learn to speak things into being. Mark eleven twenty four. What things do you desire? I tell you, I demand or what's due you. Present tense. When you pray, present tense. Believe present tense, that you receive lambano, take hold of them, present tense, and you shall have them. The prayer of faith, all of these are all present tense verbs. Present tense, present tense, present tense, imperative mood, meaning it's a command. You don't try to believe, you believe God commands you to believe and present tense, meaning the prayer of faith is continuous, repeated action. You continually speak things into being as you pray the prayer of faith and take hold of things. God wants you to put your faith in operation. Same thing in casting out demons. We gave you one example out of Mark. We'll give you a different one tonight. Mark uh, Acts 16, verse 18. Here's Jesus or, excuse me, here's Paul speaking to this woman who had this spirit of divination. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, 
Looks like he said at one time, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Does that mean he spoke at once and he's waiting maybe 59 minutes to watch until this thing finally came out? No. The word command means present tense, meaning he was commanding and continually commanding in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. That's what you do. You continually command the demon to come out as long as it takes. You keep your mouth applied. If we keep our mouth applied and casting out a demon, why don't we keep our mouth applied when we're praying or keeping our mouth applied continually in whatever we're saying? We need to have our mouth speaking continually to see God bring forth what he purposes and he will bring the promises of God into manifestation. It's so important that we get our mouth in order because what happens when you speak God's word? Well, we see the fact that the angels are going to go into operation on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Speaking of angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Well, who are the ones that are the heirs of salvation? You and I are. So the angels are going to minister for us, the heirs of salvation. Well, how do they do that? It has to do with the Word of God. Psalms 103 the other ones that carry things out, well, what puts them in operation? Do they just go in operation automatically? No. Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, his angels that are mighty and strong, Gabor, in power, manifesting power, Koak. What do they do? They do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Ah, the voice, the sound of his word. Well, who's speaking the word? You are. And then Jesus takes that word and confesses it before the angels, confesses it before the Father, and the, then the angels, what do they do? They do his commandments. They hearken to the voice of the word. They carry it out and bring these things to pass. And they are mighty and, and manifesting power. doesn't matter what's going to be in their way. They're going to fight against those evil spirits and break through to see victory. Now, it may take some time. This is why we've got to learn to be consistent in speaking what God wants, and they're not going to back off for a minute. Daniel chapter 10. Here we pick up in verse 11. He said, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you. This is an angel saying this to him. And stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word, a man stood trembling. And he said, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, the first day, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, the first day, and I am come for thy words from the first day. Well, how long did it take? The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, twenty-one days. He comes for the first day, but it's twenty-one days before he now comes to talk to him. Now, there was something going on in those 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. He was being withstood by an evil prince. That shows you the devil can hinder and try to withstand angels from manifesting and bringing forth that particular promise or whatever it is you're speaking into being. In this case, to bring, give him the understanding. So here... That shows us that what do we do? We've got to keep praying. Daniel understood that. He prayed continually. We need to keep praying too. We pray without ceasing. We speak without ceasing. We keep on. Why? You're continually putting your faith in operation. Remember, the seed is sown. The seed has to grow before the fruit comes. You speak the word and you keep speaking it. And as you keep speaking it, it's going to keep working until you see the fruit come forth in your life. This is also why we continue to hold fast whatever we're speaking. Of course, the enemy tries to get you not to speak. He tries to get you to get tired, get weary, or look at your circumstances and give up anything to stop your mouth from working. Don't let it happen. Make your mouth work for you. Hebrews 4.14 See, and then we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our Con profession or confession, what we're speaking. If you're to hold fast this, is this just for a moment? No, the word even implies you're going to do it continually. 
present tense. You're to be continually doing it. Is it going to happen automatically just because Jesus is your high priest passing the heavens? No. You've got to make sure it happens. That's why it's in the subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. You have to hold fast continually your confession, meeting the conditions to see your high priest working on your behalf, confessing the word before the Father and before the angels to see things come to pass. God wants us to understand your mouth is to be put in operation. And that's your mouth is not only a blesser, your mouth is not only a smiting the enemy, your mouth is also receiving things, your mouth is also depositing things in your heart, your mouth is a releaser of things. Of course, you can be releasing wrong, bad things too. We've got to make sure we're releasing right things in our life. And that is what God wants. Psalms 5, verse 9, is quite a statement. Psalms 5, verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. No. That means they're not being faithful. It means they're obviously not speaking the right things. They're not being consistent. Someone who's faithful does what's right and does it consistently. Their inward part is very wicked. Their throat's an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. They speak all kinds of things, but they're not being faithful with their mouth. God wants you to be faithful, firm, stable, established with your mouth speaking the right words. And you've got to make your mouth work for you. It's so important. And you're going to have to take hold of whatever you need to take hold of. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Through faith. Well, that means she had to have the word in her heart and had to be speaking something with her mouth. Sarah, also Sarah, wasn't just Abraham's faith. Sarah herself, Lombano, took hold of. That's what we do and we take hold of things with our mouth. Dunamis, power. Where's the power? In the Word of God. Sarah, because the Word that was spoken, she had to take hold of the power of, from the Word of God that was spoken. She had to take hold of it from the Lord. Through faith, Sarah took hold of power to conceive seed. Could she conceive seed the way she was at 90 years old and her womb was dead? No. In order to see the promise come to pass, she had to take hold of power from God to conceive seed because it wasn't possible in the natural. That shows you something. You can take hold of things. It doesn't matter what's going on in the natural. In the natural, it might be no way. But you can take hold of the power of God to bring the conception of something that God has to bring something into being. That's why Jesus was speaking things into being to bring things into manifestation. She was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Of course, what's the basis for you to speak anything into being? It's the promise. You're, no, you know the Lord is faithful who promised who will perform it. You got a promise. If you don't have the Word of God, you're not going to be able to speak anything into being. And you've got to understand, He's faithful. God will perform that Word if you will speak it into being. That is what He expects for every single one of us. Hebrews chapter 1, we'll close with this verse that we started out with. Who be in the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, upholding all things by the rhema, Spoken word of his power. And the word upholding is not only upholding to keep things you know, going right. This word also means to bring forth or to bring into being. It's translated to bring or to bring forth things. He was bringing forth, bringing things, all things into being by the spoken word of his power. Well, how are you going to bring things into being? Same way. The spoken word of his power, which is doing what? Putting your faith in operation through the word in your heart and the word coming out of your mouth. So what's the devil going to do? He's going to do everything to stop you from getting the word in your heart. And if it does get in your heart, he's going to try to take it out of your heart. And then he's also going to try to make sure you don't speak the word correctly and accurately. He wants you not to get precise, correct knowledge. He wants you to speak whatever you feel like speaking. 
Oh, he likes to get you to operate according to your feelings and your whatever you think and these lying thoughts. He's trying to get you to your words and speak contrary to it. Just shuts down your faith. And it see, you see nothing come to pass. That's why we've got to guard our heart. Keep get the word in our heart. Guard our heart. Make sure it stays there. And speak precise, correct, accurate knowledge out of our mouth and war, a good warfare, speak things into being, and know that every time you're speaking, it's happening. It's happening. In the spirit, it's working. Regardless of how long it takes, you keep speaking it into being until it comes into manifestation, whether it's casting out a demon, taking hold of a promise, moving a mountain, whatever it might be, or receiving something from the Lord. You keep speaking it into being. Remember, God creates the fruit of your lips as you speak the right words into being. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of how I am to take the covenant in my mouth through the Word of God and speak the promises into being which activates my faith. It causes my faith to become actively operative and effective, producing results. I thank you. I understand. Words are carriers. They contain things. I can speak life or I can speak death. When I speak the word, I'm speaking life. And I must have accurate, correct knowledge of the word that I am speaking. As I speak right words, it releases mighty force. As I speak the word of God, I am putting God's word, the power of God, into operation. The devil will try to get to my mouth to speak wrong words. And he'll try to take the word out of my heart. I will get the word in my heart. I will guard my heart. I will make sure that I'm speaking right words. And I will not stop speaking right words. I will speak things into being and see the promises of God come to pass, mountains be removed, devils be driven out, and conquer everything that the enemy would bring against me. I thank you, Lord. I will make sure that my mouth is speaking right words. Just as Jesus brought all things into being, and upheld all things by the spoken word of his power. In like manner, I will do the very same thing. I will speak words in line with the word of God that I believe in my heart to release it out, to bring it into being. I thank you, Father. As I take the covenant in my mouth and I activate my faith where the words of my mouth, I will see the fruit of faith, because you will create the fruit of my lips. The fruit of faith will come forth, and I will see my faith grow exceedingly as well. And I will see the promises come to pass. Thank you, Lord. I'll be a doer of this word, and I will see the fruit of my faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that each one of us are going to understand the importance of the words of our mouth and having the accurate word come out of us. Thank you that we're going to be doers of the word. Thank you that we're going to apply this and we will see the fruit come forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.